In many ways, 1976 was a memorable year for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It brought uncommon accomplishment and devastating catastrophe. It was a year of reaching out even more to saints in other lands by the church leadership. And it was the year of the American Bicentennial. Church members gratefully joined in the celebration because of their love for America, because of their special insights into its history, and because of its role in helping to further the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Church events celebrating the Bicentennial commenced in 1975. They included the Heritage Arts Festival at June Conference. And an original stake and ward musical, The Title of Liberty. In March, church members in the United States received four family home evening lessons telling of America's prophetic destiny. In June and July, bicentennial events were held almost daily. The Tabernacle Choir gave stirring performances in Philadelphia, New York, and Washington, D.C. In Washington, the choir performed for the National Honor America program July 3rd in the Kennedy Center. President and Mrs. Kimball were guests of the United States President and Mrs. Gerald Ford at that gala event. On Sunday, July 4th, the choir sang a bicentennial devotional in Maryland. 23,000 attended, one of the largest church congregations ever assembled under one roof. This bicentennial year is propitious for us to return totally to a life of prayer and action to please our Heavenly Father. This brings us back always to the family life of unselfishness. On the evening of the 4th, the choir performed near the Washington Monument for a live audience, estimated at over one million, and was televised nationwide. A highlight of the celebration for church members came when President Kimball met in the Oval Office with President Gerald Ford and later strolled to the South Lawn of the White House, where he presented President Ford a statuette of a Mormon pioneer family. Primary children were involved in parades, fairs, essay writing, art exhibits, and in a special production called Listen, My Children. The Relief Society sponsored over 3,000 bicentennial events, including musical productions, speeches, lessons, crafts, and the restoration of precious American memorabilia. At the Hillcomora pageant in New York, a special bicentennial introduction was presented, and a 48 by 80 foot American flag was carried by 100 members of the cast. In August, in Nauvoo, 25,000 witnessed the bicentennial musical, City of Joseph. 
to Latter-day Saints, all of it, the music, speeches, pageantry, were deeply felt expressions of appreciation for a blessed land. The 1976 General Conferences were among the most memorable in the history of the Church. Those attending April Conference had the extraordinary opportunity to vote on adding two revelations to the Pearl of Great Price as Scripture. Approval was given to add to the Pearl of Great Price the two following revelations. First, a vision of the Celestial Kingdom given to Joseph Smith the Prophet in Kirtland Temple on January the 21st, 1836, which deals with the salvation of those who die without a knowledge of the gospel. And second, a vision given to President Joseph F. Smith in Salt Lake City, Utah on October the 3rd, 1918, showing the visit of the Lord Jesus Christ in the spirit world and setting forth the doctrine of the redemption of the dead. It is proposed that we sustain and approve this action and adopt these revelations as part of the standard works of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. All in favor, please manifest it. Contrary, if there be any, by the same sign. In addition, four new members of the first Quorum of the Seventy were sustained. As additional members of the first Quorum of Seventy, Carlos E. Acey, M. Russell Ballard, Jr., John Holbrook Groberg, Jacob Diager. All in favor, please manifest it. Elder David B. Haight spoke for the first time as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. He had been called in January to fill the vacancy left by the death of Elder Hugh B. Brown. I've placed my hands to the plow and will not be looking back. We'll move forward in, the, in doing the best that, uh, that I can do with what talents I have. I'll use that and devote it to the building of the church throughout the world. At the end of 1976, the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles consisted of the following brethren. Spencer W. Kimball, prophet, seer, and revelator, and president of the church. Nathan Eldon Tanner, first counselor in the First Presidency. Marion G. Romney, second counselor in the First Presidency. Ezra Taft Benson, president of the Council of the Twelve Apostles. And council members Mark E. Peterson, Delbert L. Stapley, LeGrand Richards, Howard W. Hunter, Gordon B. Hinckley, Thomas S. Munson, Boyd K. Packer, Marvin J. Ashton, Bruce R. McConkie, L. Tom Perry, and David B. Haight. October Conference was distinguished by a major historic reorganization of the general authorities. Since the functions and responsibilities of the assistants to the Twelve and the Seventy are similar, and since the accelerated worldwide growth of the church requires a consolidation of its administrative functions at the general level, the first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve, with concurrence from the assistants and the first Quorum of Seventy, have felt inspired to call all of the assistants to the Twelve into the first Quorum of Seventy, to call four new members into that Quorum, and to restructure the First Council of Seventy. Vaughn J. Featherstone was released as Second Counselor in the Presiding Bishopric and sustained as a member of the First Quorum of the Seventy. In addition, three new general authorities were sustained as members of the First Quorum of the Seventy. Elders Dean L. Larson, Royden G. Derrick, and Robert E. Wells. With this move, the three governing quorums of the church, defined by the revelations, the First Presidency, the Quorum of the Twelve, and the First Quorum of Seventy, 
have been set in their places as revealed by the Lord. J. Richard Clark was sustained as second counselor in the presiding bishopric. He filled the vacancy left by Elder Featherstone's reassignment. Nineteen seventy-six will never be forgotten by thirty-five thousand Idaho Latter-day Saints. They were driven from their homes when the Teton Dam broke on the morning of June fifth. Eleven members were killed. Over eight hundred were treated for injuries, and property damage exceeded one billion dollars. A 20-foot wall of water hit Sugar City, Salem, and Hibbert. St. Anthony, Roberts, Rexburg, Firth, and parts of Blackfoot were also flooded. Eleven church buildings in St. Anthony and Rexburg were destroyed. High ground saved Rex College in Rexburg from the rushing water, and it became the center of relief efforts by church, civil defense, and other agencies. Eight days after the catastrophe, President Kimball and Elder Boyd K. Packer spoke to over 8,000 members at special meetings. They brought compassion, concern, and counsel. As the victims worked to help themselves, they received help from others. By August, weekday bus excursions had carried 45,000 church members to the Rexburg area for cleanup and repair work. In all, they contributed a million hours. In February, 22 church members were among 17,000 people killed in a devastating earthquake in Guatemala. The 230 elders in the mission aided in relief work. Mission fast offering funds were used to provide food. Later, tents, blankets, medicines, and other supplies arrived from nearby stakes and from Salt Lake City. Three doctors were also sent from Salt Lake City they worked with health services missionaries already serving in Guatemala. In March, ground was broken in Sao Paulo, Brazil, for the Sao Paulo Temple. Elder James E. Faust, area supervisor for South America, said it was the beginning of a great new era for the work of God in South America. Two temples were closed in 1976 for extensive remodeling, the Hawaii and Logan. In July, 3,000 people heard President Kimball dedicate the Washington Temple Visitor Center. Our Father in heaven, this morning we come to thee with a great gratitude in our heart for the ability to bring forth for dedication this lovely building with all its facilities and appurtenances. Father, we know how much this is needed to a degree. Father, we're grateful for the great temple which has been dedicated a year. Also in July, plans were announced for a second visitor center on Temple Square. The old Bureau of Information was raised to make room for the new two-story center. The signs of church growth were everywhere apparent. Thirteen new missions were formed during 1976, ten of them abroad. The number of full-time missionaries increased by 2,500 over the previous year, bringing the total to 25,000. 61 new stakes were formed, making a total of 798. Stakes were organized for the first time in France, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. Church membership increased from 3,572,202 at the end of 1975 to 
3,742,749 at the end of 1976. Members were located in over 70 countries. In April, Dr. Jeffrey R. Holland was named Church Commissioner of Education, replacing Elder Neil A. Maxwell. Dr. Holland had been Dean of Religious Instruction at BYU since 1974. I'm deeply honored to be invited to come to the Commissioner's office at a time when the church educational system is serving more than 335,000 students in 17 languages and more than 50 nations of the world. Nine new Ricks College buildings were dedicated in April by President Benson. Throughout the year, the church spoke out forthrightly in many ways on issues of pressing church and public concern. In January, the church news launched a vigorous anti-pornography campaign. And in Cleveland, 19,000 people, most of them non-members, saw a special program on the Word of Wisdom. Hello, Americans. I'm Paul Harvey. Now, worldwide, there are fewer than three and a half million Mormons. Yet there's a vastly disproportionate number of them among the superstars of competitive sports. Dedicated Mormons dominate whole pages, whole pages in athletic record books. I wonder what makes Mormons run so fast. In November and December, the church presented a one-hour television special on the family. It was seen in more than 50 major television markets nationwide and resulted in 90,000 letters and telephone calls requesting copies of a booklet elaborating on the program's message. Hurry, Charlie, you're such a slowpoke. I'm trying to. Don't forget to clean that up. You know how messy you are. Michelle, I told you I was going to wash those pants. Sometimes you're so dense. How children think about themselves is often determined by the labels you put on them. That's a beautiful boat. You're sure good with your hands. Because it was a presidential election year, as well as the American Bicentennial, the First Presidency urged members to give thoughtful, prayerful attention to the candidates and issues. In the spring, the historic pioneer homes of Brigham Young and Jacob Hamblin were rededicated by Elder L. Tom Perry. In the fall, President Kimball dedicated eight buildings at the Language Training Mission Complex in Provo. The structures included an administration building, two classrooms, and five residence halls. Elder Thomas S. Monson conducted. At Laia, Hawaii, in the summer, three new buildings, including a 2,500-seat theater, were dedicated at the Polynesian Cultural Center by elders Howard W. Hunter and Marvin J. Ashton. The new facilities more than doubled visitor capacity. The first vision, a motion picture depicting Joseph Smith's visitation by the Father and the Son, premiered in Salt Lake City in the fall. Area conferences were held on the largest scale ever in 1976 in the South Pacific, in the United Kingdom, and in Europe. The conference in the United Kingdom covered five days in June and were held in London, Manchester, and Glasgow. President Kimball stressed missionary work in the United Kingdom addresses. He declared that every worthy boy in the church should serve a mission to the Lord. 10,000 attended in London, and when it was over, they sang hymn after hymn to President Kimball. 6,000 attended in Manchester, the site of the first area conference in 1971. 
In Glasgow, saints from throughout Scotland greeted the prophet with song in the Apollo Theater. The European area conferences were held in August. They drew nearly 25,000 saints in five cities, Paris, Helsinki, Copenhagen, Dortmund, and Amsterdam. Those who attended heard from eight general authorities and from local and regional leaders. The Paris conference was attended by 4,200 saints from France, Italy, Portugal, Spain, Switzerland, and Belgium. President Kimball challenged them to have a thousand European missionaries and to become concerned, dedicated parents. In Helsinki, many of the local missionaries in attendance were there in that capacity because of a similar visit the prophet made in 1974. On that occasion, he asked the Finnish saints to supply more missionaries. And now, two years later, it was clear that they had responded. The talk centered on the importance of keeping all the Lord's commandments. The Copenhagen Conference was the largest the church had ever held in Denmark. It was attended by 3,500 saints from Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. An average of 8,000 attended the conference sessions in Dortmund, Germany. And to welcome you to the first area conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to be held in Dortmund, Germany. Und wir begrüßen Sie zu der ersten Gebietskonferenz der Kirche Jesu Christi der Heiligen der letzten Tage hier in Dortmund in Deutschland. These inspiring conferences make it possible for the leaders of the church to become acquainted on a personal basis with the leaders and members of the church. Already on this tour we have run into some countries where they thought we were not Christian. We have explained to in the news conferences that if there are any people in the world who are Christians, we are they. Special sessions were held for mothers and daughters and fathers and sons. The Amsterdam conference featured a 300 voice choir. As President Kimball entered the hall, the choir rendered an unforgettable greeting. In all, 14 area conferences were held during the year, the most for any one year in the history of the church. The South Pacific conferences were held in February and March. The leaders were warmly greeted everywhere by government and local church leaders. The arrival of the prophet was a special highlight. Members in each country gave President Kimball and visiting general authorities a royal welcome. Mama. The cultural events were outstanding, 
and each unique to its part of the world. The conference sessions themselves were outstanding. We bring to you the greeting of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in all the world. Beloved brothers and sisters, each time we have been in this land, we have become enamored with the beauty of the people the land, the climate, and perhaps more than anything else, the temple, which is like a beautiful gem in a beautiful setting. It seemed that since the church was growing so rapidly, spreading so fast, that it was only fair to you that we bring the conference to you so this is an official conference of the church for the people in this area. And welcome you to the first area conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to be held in Suva, Fiji. We also acknowledge the many members of the church and the friends tuned into these proceedings. Tonga is the first country in the world that has ever furnished more missionaries than it needed itself. So we're very happy with the relationship between the Tongan people and the missionary work. May Zion bloom where you are. That's another reason why we want to come to you and bring you the conference so that you will get used to thinking, this is Zion, uh, Tonga is Zion. It has always been a blessing to me to be able to raise my hand and sustain President Spencer W. Kimball as the mouthpiece of God on earth and as the presiding high priest over the priesthood of the church. It is proposed that we sustain President Spencer W. Kimball as prophet, seer, and revelator, and president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. All in favor, please manifest it by raising the right hand. Our message is, is one of cheer and optimism and happiness. This is a living church a family church, a progressing church. We believe in God, the Eternal Father, and in His Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. Following every conference, we see an upsurge in the missionary work and the interest of the people in the countries in which they've been held. I'm a non-member, but I came because my boyfriend's a member, and I'm quite interested in the church. I'm the Seventies Presidency here in Sydney, and uh, to us, the area conference is going to mean giant steps for the Sydney area. To come into this conference, I felt that um, I'm nearer to God. To me, it's a, a culmination of uh, all my experiences in the church. The most exciting thing is seeing the prophet again. The people of Fiji are very excited indeed to, to have the prophet come down to Fiji. The thing that touches me the most is to being able to see uh, and meet with uh, members of the church as a whole to get the um, spirit of unity. 
This has been a tremendous influence in my life and uh, the rearing of my family too. And I think one of the greatest things we'll have here in Fiji is the living prophet visiting us. And through this, I think we'll have missionary work moving even great than before. And now it was a great opportunity for me to bring my children up from Canberra to see a prophet of the Lord here in Australia. The church is our whole life, our entire life, and it has done so much for us as a family. And I know that uh, uh, he is the man chosen of God to lead and direct us through these last days. This was the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in its 146th year. A year for remembering, reaching, innovating, rebuilding. A year rich in experience, extraordinary challenge, and opportunity for service. It was, in short, a year of great historical moment for the church, for America. This was the Church in Action, 1976.